Ever wondered how we got here? There's so much to unpack, so as we honor our ancestors, let's take a step back to the struggles, the triumphs, and all the victory laps. History is critical in terms of understanding political science. As political scientists, you can't understand the present without knowing how the present arose. We have to partner with our historians to make certain that the story is told and that it is told right. History helps us to hopefully continually give us that warning signal like, hey, hey, this has happened before and we need to do our best you know, to not repeat the same mistakes. If you don't know where you've been, you won't know where you're going. And for us, it's important that we know the history so that we can tell the stories in ways that help to benefit our platforms. History is important, yes, but whose history is also as important? We cannot allow others to tell our story. So it's important that we exist in these spaces because a lot of the work that we are doing has real life consequences. Historically, you know, black political scientists were not, uh, I would say voices were not heard in the same way as white political scientists. There are narratives that simply aren't true and uh, we need more professors in the discipline of political science and history to change those narratives. Stories of double consciousness. Double consciousness, uh, as Du Bois puts it, essentially means, you know, how we understand ourselves as Black people through our own unique lens versus how we understand ourselves as Black people kind of through the lens of white America. I also think it's important to understand the history of Uh We were born out of protest, sort of, uh, against the American Political Science Association. And what we found inside the APSA at this time was a, a, a shine away from putting at the forefront the issues and the concerns of African Americans in particular, but, but people of African descent and people of color in general. APSA would not recognize that a specific category of uh, study could be organized around the black experience. And therefore, there were those within the organization who felt that in order to get this kind of scholarship out and to move forward, they had to leave APSA, which was very, very resistant uh, to talking about the black experience. When we started this organization in 1968, there were maybe 20 black people with PhDs in political science, only five women. Now we don't even know the number because most of the people here have those degrees. When INCOPES was founded, it was largely founded among members who were at historically black colleges and universities. And we now know that many more of our members are at predominantly white institutions. And so we have to think about how does that then reframe the work of INCOPES? Not necessarily the mission, because the mission remains the same. For those who don't know, there's beauty in resistance, and it's manifested through the work and responsibility of Black political scientists. The, the founder of our department, um, Dr. Mac Jones, you know, he was very clear, you know, on our responsibilities as Black scholars. The founding chair of our doctoral program at Clark Atlanta University, who, by the way, was the founding president of the National Conference of Black Political Scientists, uh, Dr. Mac H. Jones. Um, many of us uh, uh, hold very dear to our hearts his important contribution to the discipline. And he's written extensively on what ought to be the responsibility of the black political scientists to the community. As political scientists, uh, we're scarce resources of our community. And so uh, we need both to understand and be the voice of uh, our, our people's struggle. We need to be the chroniclers of our people's struggles. In addition to understanding a certain kind of, of reality, uh, it is the responsibility of the uh, of the political scientists to the black community to offer solutions, to offer some solutions. 
and to offer solutions that are grounded in the unique experiences of Black people in, in that given space. Black political scientists matter because we have a unique perspective. An educational system where Black boys are suspended at rates that signal that they are disposable and black girls in South Carolina are flung around classrooms like rag dolls by security. We need more colleagues as well as students to pursue uh, PhDs so that they can, um, you know, challenge the system. Good evening to you all. Um, I'm very happy to be here and see you all in this virtual format. I'm Kesia Dickinson. I'm a fourth year graduate student in the Department of Political Science at Michigan State University, and I will be guiding tonight's conversation. The 2021 Founder Symposium honors the life and legacy of Dr. Lucius J. Barker and Dr. Elijah Walter Miles. Both Dr. Barker and Dr. Miles were among the first African-Americans to obtain a doctoral degree in political science and government. And they dedicated their careers to diversifying the discipline through service and mentorship. Our panelists will share more about the work of both scholars. They will also talk a little about their research and their perspectives on black politics and the future of the discipline. Um, <clears throat> they will also, uh, we will, uh, answer a couple of questions first, and then we'll open it up for questions and comments from the audience. So first, I ask that each uh, panelist introduce themselves, and then we'll jump into the discussion. And so we can start with uh, Sydney. Hi, everyone, um, and thanks so much, Kesia. Uh, so my name is Sydney Carr. I'm a third year a PhD candidate and um, at the University of Michigan in the Department of Political Science and joint with the Ford School of Public Policy. Um, broadly, my uh, research is in uh, news media, political communication, um, and RIP. And I'm super happy uh, to be here with you all tonight. Justin? Hi, my name is uh, Justin Zimmerman. I'm a fourth year PhD candidate at Northwestern University. I focus on um, on uh, race class subjugated communities, particularly how those particular residents in those communities participate politically, particularly with regarding policies that focus on community violence and state violence. And Ayana. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Ayanna Best. I am a fourth year political science major in, at the University of Southern California. Um, I study race and ethnic politics more broadly um, and more specifically, I focus on Black women, um, police violence and how it affects their political participation. Okay, so the first question. What effect did the contributions Dr. Barker and Dr. Miles made in their respective careers have on the study of black politics and its continuity? What impact did these contributions have in terms of increasing a black representation in the academy? And we can start again with Sydney. Um, yeah, so um, I think what, you know, Dr. Barker thinking about um, the role in sort of uh, shaping what systemic racism look like um, and thinking how that, you know, continues to, to sort of uh, affect the experiences of Black people today, right? Um, and so I'm thinking about that work that Dr. Barker did and, and sort of applying it to sort of institutional settings, um, academia, higher ed, um, how are we thinking about systemic racism? How are we thinking about how it affects students, right? How it affects faculty members, uh, Black faculty members. Um, you know, I'm thinking about how universities in, in recent years, right, have started this sort of like DI initiatives, right? Anti-racism initiatives, right? Um, but I think the true question is, what does that really mean? And so I think as Black scholars, we can kind of sort of challenge those things, right? Um, challenge those workshops, challenge those, 
you know, things that university is putting out to sort of say, you know, we're, we're diverse, right? We're making strides toward DE and I. Um, but in the same light, we also realize as black people that like they can never do enough, right? Like the university can never do enough. Um, and so I'm thinking about Dr. Barker's work in terms of, you know, systemic racism, really breaking that down. Um, and how can we challenge ourselves to think about what can we do um, to sort of dismantle these systems and continue that work? Um, thinking about Dr. Miles, um, you know, I'm really inspired by Dr. Miles' work as a, you know, a scholar activist um, in showing us that you can not only be, you know, you don't have to just fit into this box of, you know, doing academic work. You can sort of bring the academic work into the field, right? You can be an activist, right? You can, you know, sort of have impact on communities. And so I think this is something that particularly, um, you know, political uh, scientists who are just coming about, right, in the field, um, you know, thinking about how can we structure our work so that, you know, it reaches sort of a broader audience, even when we're writing our books and our articles, how can we make sure that, you know, it's getting into the hands of people in the community? How, how, how can we make that impact? Um, and so I think Dr. Miles was definitely an exemplar of what it truly means to be a scholar, um, activist. And I think I'm, you know, I'm always considering this in my work is in, you know, I appreciate, you know, things being read by the academic community, right? Um, but I also think about like, what's the broader impact this can have. Who's going next? Okay, good. Uh, so one of the main things that I uh, think, focusing on Dr. Barker right now, that I, I think is a major contribution to the academy and to, to society in general is the textbook that he put together with Dr. Tate and uh, Dr. Jones. Uh, I don't know about any of the rest of you, but I had never, until I um, TA'd for Dr. Ruel Rogers and African-American politics, I had never seen a textbook dedicated to black politics in particularly ever. Um, I, I, you know, I've been a political science major for a very long time, I, you know, but I had never actually seen our story of politics mentioned in an actual one textbook. And that's a very big deal especially when you think about, as you put in that great video that APSA didn't want to talk about black politics and to an extent still doesn't. And to have this book, this repository of all of, uh, or at least a significant number of, you know, what we've learned about black politics and black research is a very huge deal. And something that I think is a great contribution that I hope that we could all build on top of. On top of that, I am also very, inspired by uh, this call for some type of activism by both Dr. Bar Barker and Dr. Miles. Uh, a lot of times in academia, we're told, you know, you're just kind of like the researcher, but you're not really supposed to be a, a scholar activist or anything like that. You know, people still kind of thumb their nose at the boys and stuff like that. But as black folks, we know that, you know, it's not really, I mean, it is an option, but it's not really an option to really just completely divorce yourself from the politics that come with what you're researching, especially when you're researching trauma, when you're researching uh, inequality, when you're thinking of all of those things. So to see people who are actively engaged in trying to put the first Black president in office with, Dr. with uh, Jesse Jackson in 1984, or, you know, sitting there and, you know, sitting at the counter and trying to integrate uh, restaurants, and, you know, the 50s and 60s, you know, that's a very big deal and it shows, and it's, one of our foundational aspects of understanding our roles that, as academics go beyond just publishing and actually go into real policy work. Um, so for me, um, specifically thinking about Dr. Barker's work um, or just the fact that he came from this small rural town um, in Louisiana, which is actually the same town my grandmother is from. Um, so he came from this small rural town and was able to um, become such a large figure in political science. Um, it's, it's really inspirational for a lot of um, us black scholars coming up um, after him. And as well as Dr. Miles, like coming from such, you know, humble beginnings and being able to translate um, the black experience to predominantly white audiences or a predominantly white field. And at the time, a completely white field, um, I think is important uh, to the, just the development and growth 
that um, Black politics has been able to um, achieve thus far. And being able to, uh, while at the same time translating our experience to these white spaces, also assessing the needs of our community and being able to fill those needs um, is really important. So I think activism and advocacy are, when we're doing this uh, political, like being professors or being scholars is important to remember because if we're not actually translating our work um, to our community and our society, it's, it's null and void, it's pointless. Um, so I think that Dr. both Dr. Barker and Dr. Miles did a great job of not only um, taking our experience and trans being able to uh, show the, the field why we need Black politics, why we need Black representation in the academy, um, but also staying grounded and rooted into, their, into the community and what it means to be an activist and why activism and advocacy is so important. Okay, thank you. Um, next question. Dr. Barker and Dr. Miles used their scholarship to offer solutions to the most pressing issues Black people faced at the time, and some of which we continue to face. Um, so briefly discuss their work and the issues they were addressing at the time, and what role does their work play um, in the issues Black people are facing today? And we can start again with Sydney. Um, yeah, so, you know, thinking first about, um, you know, Dr. Barker's work, um, you know, thinking about um, sort of civil liberties um, in the Constitution, right, um, and thinking about, um, you know, shaping uh, this idea of systemic racism and what that means and sort of how it affects and impacts, uh, you know, Black people in their day-to-day -day life. I think that was definitely, you know, sort of super, super, super um, impactful. And it has so many implications for what we see today. Um, so, you know, that was huge at the time um, because that was probably something that was like a novel idea um, because, you know, people probably hadn't thought about like the historical legacy of slavery um, and how that impacted uh, Black people and in, in the civil rights movement um, and what all that meant. Um, and so I think at the time, right, um, that was super impactful, right, because prior to that and, you know, thinking about Black political scientists coming onto the scene and political science beforehand, no one thought that it was important to sort of study race. No one thought that it was important to study the experiences of Black people. But you have people like Dr. Barker and Dr. Miles coming onto the scene um, and sort of bringing us these ideas, which are sort of foundational, right, and the basis for everything that we do today as Black scholars and as people who study race and ethnic politics. Um, and then going to, um, you know, Dr. Miles' work and thinking about, um, you know, how do we branch out of the academy and go into the field um, as a, you know, an active sort of social activist and actually changing the, uh, changing the scene from the ground up um, was super, super influential as well um, in sort of all the work that was done, um, thinking back to the, the civil rights movement and things like that. Um, so, you know, this, this work is sort of ongoing, um, you know, but I think that these, you know, Dr. Barker and Dr. Miles both sort of, uh, you know, were the, front, the, the framework um, for, what, for what we do today. What I would say is that they're they're giving us uh, what Dr. Barker and Dr. Miles give, especially what I've read from Dr. Barker and his textbook, is a lot of this conflict that African Americans have with trying to find full citizenship into this into this country, right? We're trying to trying to actually show that there are some type of American value that the American values of all that freedom and you know and all this liberalism and that, and that we talk about is actually coming to fruition and that struggle that comes with it uh i admit i haven't read a whole lot of dr miles so i can't give you any, too much on him but i can tell you that with dr barker that you know there is this consistent need to put together a, a history and an understanding of what are the all the issues and struggles that are going on in the black community and black politics and with that you know, trying to 
live up what well trying to get to this point of some type of a some type of realization of full citizenship to the country um so for me when i think about discussing dr barker's work on civil liberties or dr Mao's work on specifically the courts um it's just it is so relevant to black politics today and the issues that we're facing, um, especially with my work um, discussing police violence and how that relates to, you know, the, the court system that we um, hold so in such esteem. All these issues are just, those, they built foundational, um, foundational scholarship and platforms for uh, us scholars now to really dive in and look at their theories and how we can uh, expand them and it, contribute to their work. Um, and I, again, I wanna uh, talk about like their activism work and how um, they showed how important black representation is and was at the time. And we're still trying to, you know, get more representation in our electorate. We're still trying, we still face housing insecurity um, that, you know, they were facing even back then. So all this, all their work and their ideas and their theories and their scholarship really just set the foundational work for the work that needs to be done and the torches that needs to be carried for the scholars coming up behind, under them. Okay, great. So um, you talked a little about, um, Sydney talked a little about DEI and, you know, the institutions and Dr. Miles himself was uh, super involved on with APSA's Committee of the Status of Blacks in the Profession and both were mentors to scholars uh, who were students at the time. And so my question is, how do we, um, you know, measure tangible success related to efforts to build more diverse and inclusive and equitable equitable institutions? Um, what are individual strategies that scholars can employ to achieve these outcomes for scholars of color in the community, in the academy? Um, and what effect does advancement for marginalized communities within the academy have for underrepresented communities more broadly? I know that's a big question, but I think you guys can, can handle it and we can go in the same order. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I think this is a super important question. I know I, I talked about this a little bit um, at the beginning. And so thinking about DE and I, um, it's really interesting to me. Um, and I don't know if I'm a bit of like a skeptic um, when I see sort of universities and institutions sort of putting out um, these, you know, DEI, you know, workshops and things like that. Um, you know, at Michigan, I am uh, a part of a, the president of an organization, um, Students of Color Rackham, which is our uh, graduate student of color uh, organization, right? Um, and where so we advocate um, for graduate students of color at the University of Michigan, which has been really uh, fantastic. Um, but in the, you know, the same light, I've also had gotten the opportunity to work closely uh, with the deans and things like that who sort of, you know, are doing this work and they're always sort of coming to the, the Black students and the, the students of color sort of asking, um, you know, their sort of advice um, on what students need and what students want. Um, and the answer is often, you know, more than just a statement or an email put out after a major event, <laughs> right? Um, or after something shakes the, the black community. Um, so I think that's a, a tough question. I think like on the individual level, what we as scholars could do is sort of make sure that we're continuing the pipeline. And so in undergrad, uh, I had fantastic advisors um, who I think Dr. Nunnally is actually <laughs> listening um, and Dr. Simeon, right? And sort of brought me up through that pipeline to get me to where I am today, right? Um, and so that was super, super critical as a sophomore in undergrad, I hadn't heard of what, like, what is a conference? What does it mean to do research, right? Um, but, you know, I had these really fantastic um, women, Black women, take me under their wing, right? Um, and so that's so, so important. I think that's the, you know, that's the most sort of influential thing that we can do as scholars is making sure we're, 
you know, taking under um, these people into our wing, even as graduate students, right? We, we see more uh, graduate students, Black graduate students getting admitted to the program, reach out to them, send them an email, making sure that they have their community there, right? So we can sort of increase this pipeline. Um, and so I think from my standpoint, um, that's, you know, what we can do. And then did you, did you have a third question, Kezia? I know you, you said something else. You can leave it there for the sake Okay. Well, as far as like tangible successes, I think one of the big things is just numbers, right? Because we all have, you know, we, we all have like that one mentor or maybe even if you were lucky, like three or so that were able to direct you towards the, the field of political science, but that's not enough. You know, in order to have a robust field, in order to just talk about black politics, and even if black folks don't, every black person doesn't necessarily want to talk about black politics to become a political scientist, that matters. Uh, when I was at the University of Alabama, I had one professor that was black. It was Dr. Oots McKnight. And he's the only person that ever told me that I could get a PhD. I had never thought about it. I was a first generation college student. As far as I was concerned, it was a waste of time to get a PhD because you need to be making money. Why would you go, go to extra school? You know, that was my mindset because, you know, no one in my family <laughs> had gotten that far for that. So it took a black professor to go, oh, you're actually really, really, really smart. And you need to, I don't put so many smarts on myself, but, anyway, but, <laughs> but, yeah, but you know, you're intelligent. So you need to think about going to grad school. And it took me seven years to go back because I, again, you know, first generation, I don't have any money. No one has any money. I have to do something. But I eventually went back and it was because of Dr. Oost McKnight and because of everything he put in, put it, put instilled in me to actually feel like I belonged in the academy. And that's why I think major contributions come from. We have to be there because a lot of times we're not. It's part of the reason why I chose Northwestern. They got black folks, black professors. And it mattered to me. I was, I, I was skimming and skimming through USA Today. And I was like, oh, there's nobody but white people here. This isn't going to work if I want to, for what I want to study. So it matters, the numbers matter. Uh, I feel like you have one more question. And what, and what effect does that have as far as you know, the numbers go? It, it gives us better stories about black politics. Don't you guys find yourself kind of annoyed like during the summer and during election season when people seem absolutely shocked with the ways that black people politically participate? Every single election, every single, like, these are basic fundamental ways that we participate, that people are just ecstatic about that. Oh, they might use the Black church. Oh, they have great networks. Oh, they're able to coalesce around something, even if they don't necessarily agree with everything the politician does. And part of the way that we get past that and we get to a more regular understanding of, our, of what we do as a, in Black politics and how essential we are to Black politics and democracy, which is a big contribution that Dr. Barker and Dr. Miles always put you know, really focused on our research is that, you know, we have to be there and we have to be there to cite them. We have to be there to cite each other because we know everybody else isn't. So that's what I think. Um, yeah, so I think traditionally, um, you know, the measures for success in increasing diversity for institutions have always been, you know, are we increasing the number of black students we're admitting? Um, do we have any, you know, faculty of color who uh, can teach certain courses? Um, but I don't really think that that's enough or that's really, you know, like speaking to what diversity is or what it can be. Um, because even though, you know, like for, for the institution that I go to, and I don't want to like put them on the spot or anything, but um, they're admitting more Black students in their you know, political science PhD program, but they don't offer any courses on, you know, race and ethnic politics, or they don't offer any courses on black politics or, um, you know, anything to really uh, get at the interest of these students that are studying American politics that you're, you're admitting. So it, it's, you know, are you really increasing diversity by just bringing in black students that you want to continue to learn the traditional, um, you know, old white man political science that has always been there. So I think it's important um, as we, you know, come up into the scholarship and become more advanced in our careers that um, we are 
advocating for teaching more courses in REP and Black politics. We are advocating um, for certain books to be put on syllabi and um, making sure that more importantly, like these students have retention um, retention resources given to them. So um, piggybacking off of what Sydney and Justin said, on an individual level, um, it's important that, you know, uh, scholars who get more up in their career, as well as, you know, people, uh, associate professors, as, you know, more advanced professors um, are making a conscious effort to mentoring and sponsoring these students that are being admitted to these programs um, so that they want to stay, so that they feel that they have a place, so they feel that they have a community, um, because it's a, it can be a very isolating experience, especially at a PWI, where you don't see anyone that looks like you. You're the only, you know, black woman in a, in a classroom for the entire, you know, career, your entire, uh, coursework, uh, career. So just making a more, uh, a more conscious and a direct effort, um, to really help, uh, our students of color in this process and being willing and able to share the knowledge that you have, um, and not being so, you know, like stingy with, with your stuff, like I got it and I don't want anybody else to, to have access to it, it, it just won't work that way. So, um, you know, just making sure that the recruitment is important of these students, but also changing our curriculums, change, uh, adding to our syllabus. So our syllabi looks more, look more diverse, our student body, our faculty, um, and that'll really help push what diversity means and inclusion means for these institutions. Um, and to answer the last question, I think that providing more opportunities um, for students of color from various backgrounds and socioeconomic statuses will um, help underrepresented communities more broadly um, because like uh, Justin was saying earlier, you cannot, as, you can, but it's hard, it's difficult to disassociate yourself from your community that you come from, even though you uh, you have some sort of social mobility or some status because you got a PhD. Um, so we tend to go back to our respective communities and become advocates and become um, the voices for uh, our for our communities to receive the, ne the necessary resources that we need. So helping, you know, increase diversity will help our communities overall. Okay, and so I think uh, this would be a good opportunity for us to pivot to uh, taking questions. If you guys have any questions or comments, please use the chat, or you can also unmute yourself. Uh, Dr. Harad, uh, Tiffany Willoughby Harad, actually has a question already, um, and it is, what can we do to circulate uh, the foundational and important books of our colleagues? Do you read the books by Miles and Barker in your political science graduate courses? Uh, are you exam or have you examined them in PhD exams? If not, do you feel comfortable asking your departments about curriculum revisions? And I think you just touched a little, you know, on some of that, uh, Ayana, but we can go in the same order. Oh, I'm sorry, Kesia, would you just be able to repeat that question super quickly? I was, I was trying to read it at the same time in the chat, but I think it got lost. Sure. Um, so the question is, what can we do to circulate these foundational and important books to our colleagues? Do you read the books by Miles and Barker in your political science graduate courses? Mm. Are you exam or have you examined uh, on them in PhD exams? If not, do you feel comfortable asking your department about curriculum revision? Yeah, um, I think that's a fantastic question. So the short answer, unfortunately, is no. Um, and this is just speaking to my programs specifically. Um, we have like an American pro seminar that all of the first years take, and it's supposed to just be a broad examination of the, the seminal works in the field. Um, but unfortunately, of course, right, that often does not include um, these major works in Black politics. Um, and so we do a little bit, um, but not a lot. And so Dr. Barker um, and Dr. Miles' work didn't come up for me um, until I was sort of, you know, doing sort of my own Black politics um, lit review um, and reading of my own. Um, so the short answer is no. Um, however, I think it's in, it's increasingly important that we sort of examine 
what these pro seminars look like specifically at PWIs um, and you know what we what we get to call what's a seminal work um, in the field, what we label the seminal work um, what, and what they decided is useful as to be on the syllabus. Um, and so, you know, I would absolutely feel comfortable bringing that to the attention of, you know, uh, the department members of people who can um, sort of change that. Um, and so we actually have been, you know, undergoing a little bit of process of changing our um, exams, um, the major uh, American politics exam, um, you know, after some concerns and things like that. Um, so I think absolutely, yeah. Uh, Northwestern has done a good job of teaching race courses. I, I had about, I wanna say I had about five or six while I was there. But funny enough, though we've had these courses, I outside of Barker and Jones and Tate's textbook, I hadn't I hadn't read any of the rest of his work uh, from a curriculum standpoint, and I hadn't read any of Dr. Miles' work from a curriculum standpoint. So we do good. We do we're doing well with some aspects of the foundational reading, but we didn't get all of it, um, or at least as much as we could have, as far as far as the black politics part goes. However, uh, we got other we got other folks, but it, it it's funny because you know I was thinking of this, and even when I go to Incopes um, the last couple of years, I'm always like, these are so many black political scientists that are like foundational to the to us even being here. <laughs> I haven't read at all, so I've been trying to play catch up, but I'm failing it. But on top of that, um, I am comfortable talking about the career feeling with my program. I've gotten to teach a few courses where I've had I've had a chance to actually create my own curriculum, which has helped. Uh, I my professors are always well, at least, yeah, I think it's fair to say this. Yeah, my professors are open to listening to us about uh, you know which books, but of course, I'm talking mostly of the African American professors that I would be comfortable bringing that up to more so than everyone else. So it just kind of depends, but in general. I'm comfortable bringing it up. We haven't studied every foundational, foundational black political scientist that we could have, especially Barker, but we're working on it. We're getting there. Yeah, um, as I was saying before, for me, I didn't get to take any type of REP course. Um, the first course that was has that to my knowledge that has been offered was um, by has been by my advisor and it's this um, it was this semester and it uh, had to do with race and uh, ethnic policies or critical race theory and intersectionality and it was a great syllabus but I'm done with coursework and I don't have I can't I can't take no more coursework like it's just too much but um, going back to when I was taking quals like I the only Black authors um, that were a part of the seminal works that we studied were, um, you know, Dr. Catherine Tate and uh, Dr. Michael uh, Dawson. So, um, yeah, I never had been exposed to Dr. Barker or Dr. Miles or even um, any other, uh, you know, what is considered to me seminal works in not only Black politics, but American politics in, in general. Um, before I did the research on my own. And that's a, a problem because there's so much, you know, to, to read and to go over. Um, and being exposed to it so late is just like, you feel like you have a disadvantage, um, essentially, in your work. So I think that that's the issue that needs to be addressed. And the may pro probably, I don't, I'm speaking from uh, predominantly white institutions, but yeah. Okay, so we have a couple of minutes left, but uh, we do have one last question. So uh, some brief answers would, would be great. Um, so the final question is, how can we address student safety? Here, I, I am really referring to both physical safety and mental health. Many times diversity and inclusion for black students mean, means extraction. Um, how can we help students that end up on islands? Um, so I think this is a, Tough question. Um, you know, I, I think that universities are increasingly trying to address this, um, you know, making sure that 
mental health services are available um, to graduate students, um, and also some recent work on thinking about campus policing um, and what that looks like and how that can be restructured. Um, so at the institutional level, I think there's still so, so, so much work that needs to be done. And um, I, I guess it's difficult for me to answer that question. Um, but I think it's, you know, it's absolutely important. It's something that we need to be continuing um, to think about, especially, you know, physical safety as well. Um, you know, thinking about the attacks on the Capitol that happened just in January, right? Um, and a lot of students are, you know, they're concerned uh, for good reason. Um, so, yeah, I, I, all I would say to that, I think it's just something that institutions continually just need to try to address because the burden sometimes also falls onto sort of student activists, right? Um, but that should be the case. Like I think institutions need to be doing more here. Absolutely. Oh, I agree with uh, Sydney that institutions should be doing more as far as what we can do, because we all know our, our institutions are a little bit wobbly on, on, especially on student safety and on student retention. Uh, one of the things that's kept me going at Northwestern uh, is that the Black community is fairly close to each other. I mean, Andrine and Daryl are my sisters, so I spend a lot of time with them. I vent to them. Uh, they tell me when something's going on. I tell them when something's going on. And we try to do that for the, for the Black students that are coming after us and after us as well. Uh, we got a few that are, I think one presented, I think Monique presented this in code. So, you know, we try to like, mentor each other and try to keep each other going. Uh, I mean, I have problems like really trying to uh, utilize, you know, like Northwestern for these type of things because it is an elite white institution and, you know, black people are there, but they don't, they're still, <laughs> you know, they, they're working on supporting us, but they're not quite there, I guess, as, as far as, you know, as how, how they go about it. So I, I really have focused and centered on community as far as the physical safety goes, I don't find myself particularly afraid of anything happening to me. I guess the closest thing would probably be through the police, campus police, but um, it's hard to tell what really could we do about that from the positionality that I'm in right now. So I don't know. Any brief comments, Ayanna? Um, yes, I will say that um, for, for me, I know that we start, we did, uh, just start a BIPOC alliance on campus um, and we were able to you know institute demands that had to do with not only the campus policing but also we just finished hiring a, a, a BIPOC professor um, so it's important I think to speak out and um, if they don't have it you kind of got to start your own and, and do it yourself um, so that's important but yeah uh, it's, it's difficult and I'm still folks struggling on that, or struggling to have, try to figure out how to do that. Okay, thank you. Um, that's all the time we have. My apologies to uh, the audience members who asked questions that we were not able to get to. I appreciate you all for coming out. I appreciate the panelists for your insights today. Um, and I will see you guys at the award ceremony. Have a great night. Thank you.